I am glad to be back in the pulpit. I am very thankful for Pastor Tyler and uh, Minister Louie for bringing the word of God to us in these last, these last two weeks. Um, and this morning, I'm going to begin a, a series. Um, there we go. I'm going to begin a series. I said I was going to start last week. Uh, but couldn't. And the title is Offering Forth Jesus to the World. Offering Forth Jesus to the World. So the question is, why this series? Well, the last time I preached, I preached from Philippians chapter 2, where Paul says we are to be light in the darkness. And Paul, in chapter two of Philippians, he gives us a, a lot of application on how to be light in that passage, how Christians are to be light in the world today. But as I was working on that particular sermon, I noticed in Philippians chapter two, verse 16, Paul says in verse 16, we are holding fast to the word of life. Uh, the word there for fast, uh, a holding fast is a peco, meaning to hold toward, to, to hold forth, forth or to present. And so what Paul is saying is we are to present the word of life. Well, what is the word of life? The Apostle John writes about the word of life in 1 John chapter 1.1. One, one. I'll read that to you. He says this. That which was, was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. So the word of life is Jesus and his message of salvation. So we are to offer forth Jesus and his message of salvation. The question is, to whom do we offer forth the word of life. We offer it to others. We actually see this in Acts chapter 5, verse 20. The apostles, they've been arrested. And during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors. And then the angel said to the apostles, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. As children of God, we are left here on earth to offer forth Jesus and his truth to a dark world that's been taken captive by Satan. Yet, unfortunately, Christians are starting to offer forth other saviors to the world. Right now, the savior that many have turned to is politics. We have to get this election right, right? Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness and also Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. Another hope that is going around is violent revolution. I know a so-called Christian group that say that Jesus was murdered because he was a rebel. He was murdered for the cause. So Christian, are you ready to die to save our nation? If so, arm yourself and take your nation back. So both of those are wrong ideas. So my hope for this series is to remind believers what we bring to the table. To remind us that we have something powerful, so powerful that fishermen and tax collectors were able to change the world. To remind us that we truly offer the right, the only right answer to the world's problems. Amen. And that's the word of life, the son of God, the coming Messiah, the redeemer, the one who sustains the universe, the one who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. The only king that actually rules in perfection, the only prophet that could actually sit down because when he made a sacrifice, that one sacrifice, he made that one sacrifice for all and he could able to be he was able to sit down the prophets of uh, they were never the priests were never able to sit down right they always had to keep working but Christ Christ was able to sit down after his sacrifice and also Christ is the only king that actually uh, works in perfection and Jesus is also the only prophet who not only speaks the word but he is the word 
So we are to offer forth Jesus Christ to the world. And there's a reason why we don't. And so I want us to, if you could, turn to Matthew 11. Today's message is titled, Do Not Be Offended by Grace. If you turn to Matthew 11, and we're going to look at, we're going to go through verses 1 to 11. But I'm just going to read verses 1 through 3. Um, in the beginning, and then we're going to pray. Again, today's message is titled, Do Not Be Offended by Grace. When Jesus, Matthew 11, verse 1, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, this is John the Baptist, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you so much that we actually have something to give to people that actually works. And that is you. Jesus, I pray you will be with us this morning and through your Holy Spirit, you would comfort us with these words that you are our only hope and that we would truly believe that and that we would leave here, even whatever we, faith we came in here, we would leave here with even more faith to trust you, but also to offer you to a world that's hurting, a world that's searching for truth, a world that's trying to figure out right from wrong outside of you. May we be voices in the wilderness for those who are closest to us. And may this sermon help, help motivate that, Lord. Only your spirit can change people, not the sermon, not the, the, the writings of the pastor, but only your spirit can move in our hearts. So Father, I pray your spirit would move in our hearts this morning. Let's call this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read a poem to you, and no, I did not write it, um, but uh, it is written by a, by a man named Norman Sirk, and he is a pastor and a professor um, at Dallas Theological Seminary. He says this, let me meet you on the mountain, Lord, just once. You wouldn't have to burn a whole bush, just a few smoking branches, and I would surely be your Moses. Let me meet you on the water, Lord, just once. It wouldn't have to be on White Rock Lake, just on a puddle after the annual Dallas rain, and I would surely be your Peter. Let me meet you on the road, Lord, just once. You wouldn't have to blind me on North Central Expressway, just a few bright lights on the way to chapel, and I would surely be your Paul. Let me meet you, Lord, just once, anywhere, anytime. Just meeting you in the word is so hard sometimes. Must I always be your Thomas? The writer of this poem says that this poem is an honest poem about all who struggle with doubt when it comes to Jesus Christ. Now, why I read this poem about doubt? Well, for the Christian, most of our life, we will focus on faith and unbelief, right? Saved and unsaved uh, and growing our faith as we walk with Jesus. That'll be where we spend most of our life. Yet a topic we do not like to talk about, but a very real place many of us spend a lot of time is, it's in doubt. When it comes to faith, we know that is where we find our hope and the love of God. But what we're going to see today is that even in doubt, Jesus meets the Christian with love and hope. Amen. And doubt is, it's so real and it's so powerful that even the greatest believer was not immune to it. So if you look in our text, context is everything this morning. Uh, the Jewish people, they're living in a, a very, very dark world. They, uh, they are under the authority of Romans. Uh, they are persecuted. They're treated as slaves. Uh, they have no voice. Their voice doesn't matter on anything. Uh, they're taxed. Uh, and the money didn't go for better roads or education. It went straight to Rome. Um, the Jews are forced to acknowledge the gods of Rome and every day they had to deal with, uh, uh, things that were horrible to them, like abortion. That was very common or the killing of disabled children. 
Uh, they had to deal with all types of fornication, uh, fornication that was encouraged. Uh, fornication was found on everything. I mean, they didn't have TVs back then, but whether it was their silverware or paintings, uh, there would be uh, sexual acts painted on all of these things. Every time they stepped outside, they had to engage uh, in this Roman world. So that's why when you read the New Testament, uh, there's this great expectation or desire for a coming Messiah, a savior, the one who would free Israel from their oppressors and who would bring a new kingdom. Think about the Samaritan woman in John chapter four, verse 25. She says, I know the Messiah is coming. What about in John six fourteen? It says, when the people saw the signs performed by Jesus, they said, this is indeed the prophet who was to come. John the Baptist, the people were so anxious for a Messiah that they, always, they often thought that John the Baptist was the Messiah and he often had to correct them. In Luke chapter three, verse 15 to 16, we read this. As the people were in expectation, all who were questioning their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now I want you to remember that passage because we're going to come back to that passage. So by the time of John the Baptist, many people had lost hope that a Messiah would actually come. In fact, it had been 400 years since God had spoken through a prophet to the Jews. This is also known as the silent years. But John the Baptist had sparked a revival in the people. Now, who is John? John, he's the cousin of Jesus, the one who kicks in his mother's womb when he hears the voice of his aunt Mary. John is the one prophet that the prophet Malachi prophesied about who would be a voice in the wilderness, making the path of the Lord straight. That's Malachi chapter three, verse one, where it says, behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. Well, well, John, John did that preaching repentance to the people, drawing big crowds and baptizing them, but continuing to tell them he wasn't the Messiah, but the Messiah is still coming. But I want you to notice something in this passage. Notice that John is in jail. Going back to the injustice that Jews faced on a daily basis under Rome, John is in jail because he calls out Herod for marrying his brother Philip's wife, Her Herodias. Philip was still alive and Herodias was also Herod's niece. So John, he called all this sin out twice, actually, to Herod. Well, Herodias, she didn't like that. Now, Herod, he liked John, but to appease his wife, he had John the Baptist thrown into prison. So John is in prison and John is hearing all the things that Jesus is doing. So John the Baptist, he sends his disciples, two of them, to ask Jesus a question. We find the question in verse three. Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Now, Maybe you've read that before and you thought, you know, John just wants to know if Jesus really is the Messiah. But that's not what's going on here. You must remember a couple of things that have happened already before John went to jail. In fact, John has made some statements about Jesus before he went to jail. I'll give you some of them. John chapter one, verse 29 says this. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him. This is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If you go to John 1, verse 34, it says, and I have seen, this is John the Baptist speaking, I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. What does this mean? What does John mean by saying he's seen and borne witness that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, you have to remember that John the Baptist actually baptized Jesus and he gives the testimony of what actually happened during that baptism. In John chapter one, verse 32 to 33, 
John says, I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And we also know that Matthew records that during the baptism, the father actually speaks and says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We don't know, but possibly John the Baptist not only saw the Holy Spirit fall like a dove, he may have heard the father speak. So this means that the question that we find in verse three, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? It's not a question of wonder, but it's a question of doubt. Strong doubt. In fact, John the Baptist is actually mocking in a sense. John is saying, I thought you were the Messiah, but I guess I was wrong. I'm hearing about all your actions. And you sure are busy doing everything under the sun except what you should be doing, Jesus. Look at the passage. John, he heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ. He sent words by his disciples. He's questioning Jesus. Now, what changed? How does John go from, look, there's Jesus, the Lamb of God, sent to take away the sins of the world. How does he go from that to I don't think you're the Messiah, Jesus. How does this happen? Well, I think it's the same thing that still happens today. The same reason why today Christians have turned from their hope in Christ and looked for other places to lay their trust. I think it's the same reason why this election is so important to Christians. I believe it's doubt. And what I found that even in my own life is that doubt can be masked in, in different emotions. Like bravery. You may think you're watching a person be brave, but really you're watching a person who's walking in fear and in doubt. They may be saying the, the right things, but really there's so much anxiety and anger that they're walking in because of doubt about their faith in Jesus Christ. That they've put on a mask of bravery, but there's really doubt behind them. Another thing is that mature Christians struggle with doubt. You know, sometimes Christianity is like high school. Everyone is putting up this fake image of walking in faith and never doubting when that's not real. Mature Christians struggle with doubt. Look at John. John is a mature believer. He leads the greatest revival the world has ever known. He saw the Holy Spirit fall like a dove on Jesus. He comes from a Christian home, good believing parents. He keeps himself unstained from the world but he still experienced some extreme doubt. Now, if we look at John, we can see some key elements of doubt that happens in your life that causes you to have doubt. And maybe some of you are facing some of that, some of these right now. So I want us to look at them. What can grow doubt in our hearts? Well, number one, extreme circumstances. Extreme circumstances. John is in jail. John's like, how is the Messiah here and I'm in jail? Which, if we're being honest, on a human level, it's a pretty good question, don't you think? How is the Messiah here and I'm with the Messiah? I, why am I in jail and unjustly in jail? Right? Right? John didn't do anything wrong. All he did was call out a king who married his brother's wife, who's also his niece. John is experiencing injustice. He's in prison, but also his government is unjust. So there's the personal experience of extreme circumstance. And John lives in this evil, dark world. But he's also he's, he's feeling it from his government. And also he's feeling it just personally. He's in jail. Does that sound familiar? You know, I, I often think about extreme circumstances. I, I tell young pastors when I meet them, 
Um, I hope you don't think that America isn't going to start locking up their preachers. I, don't, I hope you don't think America is not going to start, gonna, is not going to try to throw preachers of the word in jail. You better get your, your house in order. I hope your wife is prepared to possibly be alone. I hope your church is raising up uh, pastors, to, uh, preachers to step up when they arrest a pastor. You can throw another one in there because that's going to start happening. And you're a fool if you think that's not going to start happening here. Extreme circumstances. But extreme circumstances that you find yourself in will lead you to doubting the goodness of Jesus. And that's what John is experiencing right now. He's in, in this passage. Well, he's in jail. He's hearing about all this stuff that Jesus is doing, and yet he is not feeling any goodness because he's in prison. This is why we have Christians who are turning to politicians as our hope or turning to violence. But the Christian life is not a life of works and trusting in our strength or our ideas. I want to tell you, this is the Christian life. Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now listen, we, don't think, we know John the Baptist knew that passage. He knew it. He probably he knew it better than us. But when the devil starts speaking to you, is Jesus really who he says he is? Does Jesus really love you, John? Because if he loved you, why are you in prison? So one of the things that causes doubt in our life is extreme circumstances. What else causes doubt in our life? Well, number two, expectations. Sometimes it's not the word of God that we have faith in. Sometimes it's our expectations more than the word of God that we have faith in. And here's what I mean. The apostles, John the Baptist and the Jews, they were all expecting Jesus to bring the kingdom of God and to rescue them from the Romans. But Jesus what is Jesus doing? Well, he's hanging around with sinners, right? He's preaching and teaching. Uh, he's healing people. Jesus, can we just get on with the show? Let's destroy the Romans. Let's, let's set up the kingdom of God. What, do, what does that sound like today? Jesus, could you just return now? Why are you taking so long, Jesus? The Democrats are about to take over. What's taking so long? <laughs> What's taking so long is his grace. What's taking so long is his mercy. Second Peter three, nine, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You see, God, he will hear your plans. You can you can pray to the Lord, which is a wonderful thing. But he will only fulfill his will. Do you get that? You can pray to the Lord and give him your plans. In fact, the Bible often says the, Bible, the Lord laughs. Right? I love that our God laughs. But often he laughs at our plans. It's one thing that he laughs about a lot. And God will hear your plans, but he's only going to fulfill his will. See, the wrong expectations can cause you to doubt. Now, you may be saying, well, John didn't really have wrong expectations because the Messiah is going to come to set up his kingdom. And I would say you're absolutely right, which leads to one more reason that John is experiencing doubt and why many of us experience doubt. And this is what a pastor named, in, in uh, Kentucky named Ryan Fult Fulterton, he calls, he calls this deficient theology. Deficient theology. So this is number three. One of the reasons that we have doubt is deficient theology. Here's what he means. <clears throat> I've already mentioned that we aren't promised comfort and happiness. And, you know, like the online pastors promise us that all of our days will be happy. Uh, but so there's a misunderstanding there. But there's also a mis misunderstanding of the first and second coming of Christ. Uh, remember, I told you Luke chapter three, verse 16 to 17. We're going to go back to that. Let's go back to that now really quickly. Matter of fact, can you just turn over there? Luke chapter three, verses 16 to 17. I think this is 
very helpful to get into the mind of John. I'm going to read it again. This is Luke chapter three, verse. Actually, I'm going to start in 15 and we'll go to 17. So this is the people are wondering if John is the Messiah. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming to the coming. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. John's biggest issue is not truth. John has the truth. John's biggest issue is timing. Notice that John's preaching, it's imminent preaching. It's right now preaching. Jesus, the Messiah, is coming to, to save his people and to burn unbelievers and those who knew what you see how his his preaching is imminent. Everything that he says is true. Uh, John is like the time is to repent now. Uh, the Messiah is here to take his people away. But John was not expecting 2000 years of church history. John was not expecting in 2024 we'd be in Belmont still talking about this situation. John couldn't see that. John was expecting now. And when you have deficient theology, well, it will cause doubt in your heart. It's happening today. I'm so shocked that so many people are trying to set up the kingdom of God on this earth. And I get it. Like, you know, we're aliens. All right. And like, I'm into sci-fi too. So I get it. Aliens, they come to earth. And they make the earth their home. Uh, I get it. That's not what Christian aliens do, though. Christian aliens, we're here as a people to, to, to look at the world and say, hey, there's a better kingdom that you can enter into. Do you understand that? Deficient theology says something else. It says the time is, is now. We got to do this. Even when the Lord tells us himself that we do not know the day when he will return. Wrong theology says, let's make America a Christian nation because fear and doubt is causing us to think that Jesus isn't in control or that Jesus has forgot us or worse, that Jesus isn't going to return. You know, I consider myself a mature, growing Christian. I sure hope to be. I want to be. Um, but I must admit, like this, this, this has been a rough year due to my extreme circumstances and due to some of my misinformed expectations where even I, maybe not just as John has done it, but in a way have questioned the Lord, are you really who you say you are? And so, and I know I'm not the only one in this room. So how does Jesus handle our doubt? How does Jesus handle it? Well, if you can go back to Matthew 11, let's read verses four through 11. Back to our passage, Matthew 11, verses 4 through 11. So Jesus has been asked the question, are you the one or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Verse 7, as they went away, Jesus began, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. How does Jesus 
deal with our doubt? Well, well, first, let me tell you how I would have dealt with John the Baptist if I was Jesus. I would have said, John, are you serious? First off, my father in heaven allows you to be the messenger who is spoken of in Malachi chapter three. Second, you got to be my cousin. Third, you got to baptize me and see the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove fall on me. You of all people should be the last person to doubt whether or not I'm the Messiah. That's how I would have handled that. But thankfully, I'm not the Messiah. How does Jesus deal with John's doubt? I love this. Jesus says, John, I love John. I love John. In our doubt, Jesus actually draws closer to us with his love. Jesus says there's no one greater than John the Baptist. Born to women. Born to a woman. Jesus says to John, Jesus says to John, like, listen, John, look at what's being done. But he says to the other people, hey, hey, John's doubt. John is the I love John. I love him. But what he does say to John and to his disciples who take him the word, Jesus says, hey, John, the blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to him. Uh, all of these are the promises that are found in the book of Isaiah. So what Jesus is actually saying to John, if you could take your eyes off of yourself and off of your circumstance and off of your expectations, you would be able to see that God is working everything that he said he was going to do. I said this the last time I preached those in fear of this election, they're just not reading their Bibles. Those who are shocked at the darkness in this world are not reading their Bibles. I mean, we're told everything that's going to happen except the day when Jesus is going to return. He's, he's given us everything. But more importantly, God is actually working in the dark world. How do I know? Because he saved me. Because he saved you. Because people are still being saved. Because miracles are still happening. Because missionaries are still being sent. God is alive and very alive and well on his throne. Jesus says to John, very blessed is the one who is not offended by me. And that's why I named the sermon, Don't Be Offended by Grace. God is so gracious. Don't let that grace offend you and cause you to doubt. Don't let the mocking of the world, you know, where is your Jesus? Don't let that cause you to doubt. The Bible actually says in the last days, it'll be like the days of Noah when he returns. People were being married. People are partying. Uh, people are still chasing their own glory. And then, boom, it happens. The return of Jesus. For some, it's going to be joy. For the rest, it's going to be begging and pleading for forgiveness and finding no hope because it's too late. Uh, there's a man by the name of J.C. Ryle, famous for his exposition of scripture and his devotional works. He wrote in 1856, he said this. The best of men are only men at their very best. I love that. The best of men are only men at their very best. What he was trying to say, and he goes on to say, patriarchs, uh, prophets, apostles, martyrs, fathers, reformers, Puritans, all are sinners who need a savior, holy, useful. They're honorable in their place. But at the end of the day, they're sinners after all. Jesus said John the Baptist is the greatest man to ever live and the greatest man struggled with doubt. If this is you, that's OK. You need to admit that, but you can't stay there. Jesus said, don't be offended by me. So how do you turn from doubt? Well, if you're struggling with doubt, you turn from doubt to truth. You turn towards truth. The answer to doubt is a bigger view of God and his word. The enemy wants the Christian to live in doubt because the enemy knows the word. He knows Hebrews chapter 11, verse six. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. The enemy wants you to be stuck in doubt. So the question that the Christian needs to ask himself is, he or she, what is true? 
Remember, our faith is not based on how we feel, but what we know to be true. We place our faith in Jesus and his word because Jesus is truth and that no word in the Bible has been found to be a lie. And for 2000 years since Jesus ascended to heaven, the church is still here offering forth Jesus as the hope of the world and the hope of the church. And in first Timothy, first four, excuse me, chapter four, verse 10, it reads for to this end, we toll and we strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. So I'll say this. I don't know what this week's election will bring, but what I do know is that Jesus loves me because the Bible told me so. I know that God will and can do only what he wants to will. I know that we are to be light in the world and to tell others of another king about another kingdom where peace and righteousness reigns. And it's an everlasting kingdom where everything sinful you ever did or you've ever done, no matter how sinful you can be forgiven. And it's a kingdom where you can find love for your soul, which you can't find anywhere else. You see, Christians, we are to offer forth Jesus Christ to a world that's lost. And that's what's going on right now. The world's trying to find hope and peace outside of the creator. And we need to offer Christ to the world. And in times of doubt, I want to add, you need to offer Christ to yourself. You need to build yourself up with truth to overcome some of the doubt you may be feeling right now living in a world where we don't know what the future may bring. All we do know is that the Lord said he'll never forsake us. And we do know that the Lord wins. He has won. We know that we fight from victory. We know that we're not promised good. We know that we're not promised tomorrow. Just because we are the children of God, we are not promised life. But what we are promised is that one day that we will be standing with the Lord, with thousands from every tribe and every nation standing around the throne, um, never having to worry about sin again, only knowing love forever and ever. That is what we have to stay focused on. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being able to handle our doubt and not in anger, but in love, drawing closer to those who doubt. I think about Thomas and how in his doubt you drew closer to him. Or I think about my own doubt and my own worry and how you continue to show through your word and through your people and through situations uh, that you are very present to our worries. You are very present to our situations. I thank you that even the evil that the enemy wants to do to us um, is on a on a tight rope that you that the enemy can't do can only do what you allow. I thank you that you are a great king, one who has a kingdom that's going to get everything right. So we don't have to depend on this kingdom of America. I thank you that you are the greatest prophet who is the word. You've spoken the word because you are the word and all your words are true. Um, Father, I just pray for your people here, your the members of your church here at Open Door, that we, even in our doubt, would run to you. We wouldn't run away from you. That we would walk by faith, not by sight. I pray that we would be reminded of that, not just next week, but every single day of our lives, that we have a job to do, that you've empowered your church with your spirit to offer forth Christ in this wicked world. Lord, let us not be scared. Uh, Let us not have fear because that is not fear is not the spirit from you, Lord, but let us have a spirit of hope and of love. Let us trust you even more um, in our times of doubt. And Lord, may we see doubt flee from our life. In all things, may we continue to trust in your sovereign will and your sovereign power. Uh, Father, may we see even more people in this community um, look at us and see our faith and see us walking not in doubt and wonder and ask why we are so confident in you, God. And may we speak to them and tell them why. It is because Jesus has died for our sins that, God, you have kept your word. 
Um, Father, may we be gospel witnesses uh, in our lives to our friends and to our family. May they see us walking boldly and trusting in you, Lord, even in the midst of darkness and, and anxiety. Lord, may we be something so different that people be drawn to. I call this in Jesus' name. Amen.